Uh, this video is a reproduction of my colloquium talk about modular arithmetic and piadic numbers. First, we're going to review or go over this modular arithmetic, and it seems the modern use of the modular arithmetic was invented by the great mathematician Gauss. Let us first go over the definition. A and B are integers. We say A is congruent to B modulo Pn if P to the N divides A minus B. So that's a concise way of defining um, this congruence notation. This is three um, negative symbol. Looks just like an um, equal symbol. They behave a lot like an equal symbol. But they, another way to interpret this one is they have the same remainder when they're divided by P to the N. A and B have the same remi uh, remainder. Like I said, it behaves a lot like an equal symbol. So if you have A is congruent to B, and if you add the same integers both side, or if you multiply the same integer both side, the uh, congruence relation, the remainder, um, are the same. If you happen to have a two congruence relation here, you can add side by side like this, or side by side you can multiply, and this congruence relation remains the same. To um, do the division, like uh, manipulation or operation to both sides of the congruence relation, we require a little bit of a result. This theorem is the standard result appearing in all, probably all elementary uh, number theory books, but uh, they don't title that theorem um, with a name, so uh, just for this purpose of this talk, I'm going to name this uh, result the fundamental theorem for principal ideal domains. So the result is like this. If A is not congruent to 0, that's the same as P doesn't divide A, or analogous to the statement uh, for equal is A is not 0, similar to that. Then there are two integers, x and y, such that this combination can become 1. And here's a P to the n, and I forgot to mention all this the modular result and up to here, it's, there is a pretty much the version for any arbitrary modulus number there, not just p to the n, but in this talk we're going to focus on p to the n part, so we're stating this result for prime power p to the n. So if you um, reduce, that's what they say, we reduce this one to a congruence relation, because this part is divisible by p to the n, this is going to be remainder 0, the only this part of the remainder will match the remainder of the right hand side which is the smallest positive integer so a remain one is the best way to represent that re uh, remainder part so here's a statement if you reduce that uh, fundamental theorem for a principal ideal domain you get this one a times y is congruent to one modulo p to the n the other term is divisible by p to the n so we get this statement So if you have A and B as a common factor in both of this congruence relation, you can cancel those A as if this is an equality, and if A is not equal to zero, we know we can cancel those two factors A and uh, get this B equal to C, but that kind of thing can happen in this congruence relation as well. If A is not congruent to zero, then we can multiply that multiplicative inverse Y both side, and that'll change that to 1 and 1. So this y really does behave a lot like the reciprocal um, that is found in the rational, rational numbers. And instead of this, we actually use this uh, inverse uh, reciprocal notation like this in the modular congruence. Here's an example. If 2013 times y is congruent 1 mod 5 to the 10th. So there is the theorem for principal ideal domain says there is y, so if you multiply it to 2013, is remainder is 1 when it's divided by 5 to the 10th. So it's the computer search I did, although um, in the typical number theory course you learn method um, to efficiently calculate uh, this y. y turns out this 555,702. They behaves like a multiplicative inverse of 2013 modulo 5 to the 10th. 
So what that means is that if you multiply that 955,000 number to 2013 and subtract 1, this is 5 to the 10th times 197. So it's this, this thing here is divisible by 5 to the 10th. And how to find such a number is, all, um, again, it's called a Euclidean algorithm. And if you rearrange this equation, you can turn that equation into the it, assertion in the theorem that I just showed e to the n times x plus uh, y times um, a times y equals 1. We will be using this um, type of idea to solve uh, equations, uh, looking for equations for integer solutions. For example, if you have this linear congruence um, equation, then we can add 2011 both sides and multiply the multiplicative inverse of 2013. That's how you're going to solve this equation. So here's how it goes. That if you add both sides, you get a right-hand side 2011 and single term in the left-hand side. If you multiply multiplicative inverse and um, you cancel that multiplicative factor, isolating left-hand side like this. So this 2013 inverse of 2013 was this 955,000 number. If you multiply, you get this number. X is, uh, can be this uh, congruent to this number. This turns out to be more than the 5 to the 10th, so you can reduce it by taking its remainder, and they, um, then you can reduce the number to slightly. So what that, what that means, any integer in the whole world of a whole set of integers um, that satisfy this relation, modulo 5 to the 10th, must be congruent to 7,854,222. Well, this congruence relation is merely a tool to um, solve the problem of this A is um, the usual uh, equation, A equals B. If A and, and B are exactly the same number, and of course this remainder is the same, so if we have the statement, we have simply um, this simply implies that A is congruent to B, but of course A is congruent to B. It's not, um, you can't get A is equal to B, but if you investigate, and for many different P primes, maybe there's something you can say about this uh, original equation. So that's um, how we're going to use this modular arithmetic. So here's an example we're asked to show this equation has no integer solutions. If you try any pair of integers here and it's not going to be, it's not going to turn out 21. That's what we want to show. The first part of the argument goes like this. The choice of this p equals 5 is inspection. You have to look around and figure out which prime does the trick. So the rest of the part of the trick goes like this. Suppose that x and y are solutions, so we have actual numbers in here. So if you, you can turn this equation into a congruence equation. So 2x squared is there, but 5y squared has 5 in it. So if you do the modulo p, that's a remainder 0. So you can replace that part with a remainder 0. Then we have 2x squared equals congruent to 1. And 3 turns out to be the multiplicative inverse of 2. So that you can isolate 2x squared by multiplying 3 both sides. So multiply 3 here, becomes a 3, and 2 times 3 is congruent to 1, so its left-hand side is simply x squared. It's congruent to 3 mod p. So if there is a solution, it must satisfy this quadratic congruence relation. Here's what really happened. Um, these are the entire remainder class of a, re we call it a residue class. 0, all the numbers has this 5, um, has remained one of those five numbers in here, 0 through 4. If you square that number, it's the same as squaring the remainder. That's the, the first uh, manipulation um, cases that I showed earlier. So if 1 is squared and it becomes 1, if th 2 is squared, you get 4. 3 is squared and it's 9, but modulo it's 4. 4 is squared, 16. Mod 5 is the same as 1. So if you look at all the numbers, whose remainder must fall into one of these kind, but after you square it, you don't get all the possible remainder. You only get 0 and 1 and 4. 
So if this statement, think about it, if x and y integer such that it satisfied this equation, then we did use that x squared, that x coordinate is squared, must have a remainder 3, but we looked at all kinds, there is it's not possible to have a remainder 3 after we square whatever the given number is. So it necessarily contradicts this fact, therefore what is wrong is what we have supposed is necessarily wrong. There um, are not any solutions, because if there are solutions, it leads to uh, us to a contradiction. Now following is the idea toward to actually solving, finding the equations. Um, so this may or may not have an integer solutions. That technique we just tried doesn't work nicely in here. So we are trying to actually find a solution. So this is just an idea and you will not see the complete method of finding the solution. This is an idea leads us to the um, periodic number. First idea here is that unique factorization property of integers. If there are solutions, and if you're looking at a particularly factors of a certain prime, let's say 5 or 7, something like that, then x can have this prime power, p, and y can have this prime power, p, and this n can be 0. So maybe this x and y do not have this prime power that we're looking at. So these n's can be 0. So n is greater than or equal to 0 m is greater than or equal to 0. And we are writing it like this so that a and b do not have any more prime um, p factors in it. So this is the um, maximal power that goes into these integer solutions. So the goal is that we want to figure out what this n and m are. And once we figure that out, we move on to the next prime and see if, um, what other factors are involved and possibly involved in the solution set. The way we figure out this n and m are not looking at the prime p because if they have prime factor p or here or there, then if you look at mod p, then it's going to easily end up at a zero. So we don't know what that m is. So we have what we have to do is we have to look at higher power, the modulo p to the k. If k is high enough, it's going to reveal this correct power n and m. And what you get a and b in front of it here is not the real number, but this n and m that shows up in the effort of solving this equation modulo p to the k turns out to be correct one. So once you figure that out, and then you move on to the next prime and next prime and so on. And by what size of the prime do we stop this process, and and how do we conclude? Um, often the the solving this part is effective. So when you're given an equation, when you're dealing with a modular p to the k, and we can effectively usually define, um, find this uh, sufficiently large k so that we can determine, okay, n and m are the only possibility. But we do not have effective way of telling, okay, up to what size of p prime should we try, that we don't know. So that's the big theme in the number theory in a very fancy form in the literature we see a lot and um, we have to put this boundary so that our search can be uh, complete. Um, there is no universal algorithm to do that. That's the famous um, problem in number theory. But um, given an equation, maybe we're lucky and we'll be able to put some nice bound on up to what prime we should look at so that this search is complete. Now once you have that boundary if you guarantee that you don't have to look a whole lot of prime you can only look at the prime up to 13 and uh, for those primes up to 13 we can try this um, modular method in p to the k and once you figure out all the n and m and because of unique factorization only possibilities that put those all those prime powers here and try plus minus and put those all the prime powers there and plus minus and that's the way to, if there are solutions, they, they must be in there, so then you can try if they really work out as one. If none of them works, then you can conclude that it has no solution, something like that. But the following theorem is another nice way to putting um, the result into the mod another modulus congruence. It's called Chinese remainder theorem. 
Suppose we have um, tried these many primes up to various different powers, then we're looking for how do we, if we have this much of the result, we realize that there is a solution in there, there is a solution in the P to the K2, and how do we put these things together? And the Chinese remainder theorem tells you it's very effective um, algorithm to calculate the following. And after we went through a calculation, it'll give us the um, one and only one pair um, for given a solution for each of them here, one and only one pair, modulo the product of all these primes, powers. So there is a um, machinery of going from each solution to the one solution that fit into the bigger modulus space. So this is called Chinese remainder theorem. It's a nice, nice theorem to, to know and then used a lot in even a fancier level of um, number theory. Turns out this was first um, discovered by Chinese mathematician Sun Tzu and between the 3rd and 5th century. Now that was very algebraic way of um, thinking about the solutions and the following can be thought as a more analytic way of looking at the problems. So let's think about the situation where this equation has an integer solution both positive and we write this each coordinate x and y in this base p expansion, space p expansion. So you're probably familiar with base 2 expansion and base 10 expansion and base 16 expansion, something like that. So if you have a number, integers, you can always write that in this um, base p expansion. And suppose this s and t, the power involved in here, very, very high. And our k here, what we're looking at, is actually just a 4. So although it, this expansion goes to really, really many, many uh, digits, coefficient involved in here, we're just looking at this this part in here. If this p are not the prime number, but it's 110, for example, then this will be the decimal places exactly. And cutting it here is the same as looking at some approximate solution of um, two numbers. So we can think of this in this, in this um, base p expansion, we can think of this trunk um, taking the modulo p to the fourth as kind of approximation of the solution into this, um, in this expansion. And considering like p to the s and p to the t is kind of small quantity. So if you make a comparison with the shape of this algebraic shape to this algebraic shape of a decimal expansion down to and hundredth and thousandth of digits, um, decimal places, this k represent in this arithmetic uh, interpretation the depth of integer solution. Let me use this picture to represent this idea in a slightly different way. For example, this number p to the s, where s is really, really big, I was saying this considered a small number. So z, the, all these integers, uh, can be organized in this following way. These a number and then outside is a collection of all number that is not divisible by p. Inside it here is number divisible by p but not divisible by p squared. And inside it here is divisible by p squared but not divisible by p to the third. And zero, number inside here, is always divisible by any number inside it here. So if you look at it as a kind of approximation, we want to treat this one as down to some refined decimal kind of digit expansion and those number p to the s and p to the t consider small number like down here something that is very close to zero. So this idea is actually valid. We can turn this one into a fancy metric space that satisfied the typical triangle inequality. So um, it's kind of crazy but it is all valid there. And there's nothing special about this particular prime p. If you use different prime q, then all these integers line up in a different way, and we're defining the different metric to this integer. So another comparison I'd like to make with the real uh, numbers is that when you have to find the solution to an equation, you, you will be doing um, and solving the equation one at a time for modulo p to the k and whenever it's a higher power. For example, we go and find a modulo p first 
and then see if we can actually consistently lift that solution keeping that a0 and go to the next level and then so on so if you happen to have the solution modular p p3 p to the third so we have this solution in here and consider the modular p to the fourth and see if we can lift this solution keeping this all this three coefficient can go to the next level so here's an example so this is a simple equation that you can solve x is negative one and we're considering prime p um, being five and this is uh, negative one suppose we happen to be looking at more complicated equation where x equals negative one is a solution and pretend that we don't know x equals negative one is a solution we just go in and are looking for a solution modulo the pk and see what we discover so here's the first attempt if you look at the modulo uh, p realize that you're just checking zero to four realize the four works so whatever the extent um, the solution we're looking for integer solution looking for its p expansion must start from four and then we try to go to the next level p squared and see what we get and if you when you solve it you realize you can actually keep this four and just compute another digit it's not something completely different and when you go to the next level you can keep this previous two digits and add one more digit so this is what I mean by the consistent solution shows up as you uh, raise the level of a prime power and higher and higher by keep doing that you may realize it actually never stops it's going to be always maybe you can mathematically conclude that this is going to be always a 4 and 4 all the time at least first let me explain why this one x plus 1 is 0 minus p to the k if you add 1 there if you add 1 there that 4 plus uh, 4 changes to 5 5 is p that's our uh, prime number that can be added in here that changes to 4p plus p so that is a 5p which is p squared so that will be added to the 4p squared that changed to 5p squared all the way up here this will change to everything disappeared and this changes to 5p um, p times p to the k minus 1 that's p to the k much of the p to the k that's the same as 0 so if you add 1 here everything is shifted and becoming 0 and eventually disappeared into this p to the k so up to p to the k x behaves like a negative one but x is not yet negative one if you look at this number this is not negative one but we want negative one in our number system and it's not quite giving us negative one and but it seems like if we keep writing it like this forever this seems like that number behaves uh, like a negative one that's kind of my pretend motivation to go into actually the infinite sequence of this expression so of course because the way it's written it's adding in higher and higher powers of p it makes no sense in the real line it's divergent sequence so we can only handle this and uh, algebraically and formally so we formally define this infinite sum it's not stopping and it goes on forever just like a decimal expansion but what this is is just notation of the sequence this plus is a separator of each individual term instead of comma and p is kind of attached there indicating um, where this coefficient belongs to even though if it is swapped around so this is not we ident we're not identifying this infinite sum in the real line but we're identifying it in as a sequence but this is not just a sequence it has this p and p squared built into it and and it came from this natural modular arithmetic structure so it's arithmetically motivated and kind of um, completed to the depth of this prime power and this is a nice way to say it and everything here is can be mathematically correctly um, de defined here but uh, we're just um, giving you this formal definition and introduce some arithmetic uh, what to do with this infinite sequence and this collection of this is sequence, this one sequence here, infinite number, considered as a one number in this number system. And and the collection of all those infinite sequence, as long as it varies between zero and p minus one, and all the sequences considered as a number in this something called the p-adic integers. 
if you think about the way we had constructed all this thing, there's no need um, p being a prime number, but we will be using this prime uh, property um, in this sense, in the following sense. So first we need fundamental theorem for the principal ideal domain, and using that we can easily show all the numbers here except the zero. Um, what I wanted to say is, is a zero divisor. So this uh, we say this one does not have a zero divisor. Whenever you have a times b equals zero, which are one number a, capital A, let's say, another number capital B, if a times b equals zero, either a has to be zero or b has to be zero. That's a natural property you enjoyed in usual integer, not periodic integers, and the real numbers, and all pretty much all the number system. To guarantee that, you need this. Um, base p being prime. This p-adic integer is um, formally uh, nicely defined by Hensel, and since uh, the Kummer also knew what's going on with this kind of the system and used this p-adic numbers in his research, but he did not formally define like Hensel did. But usually the credit of the invention of the p-adic number goes to these um, two people.